I first saw him at Forest Hills, the West Side Tennis Club. You could see he had such speed and he was enjoying it so much. And I said to somebody, who is that? And they answered, Vetus gerolitis. Well, I found out later, it's gerolitis. Back in, in the early 70s, and uh, I just came out to uh, turn in pro, leaving UCLA, and I'm playing this tournament in, uh, I think it was New York, and, and I hear I'm supposed to play this this young kid that's got a lot of flair and, and a lot of flamboyance, and has actually played some pretty damn good tennis, too. And, and it happened to be Vetus, and uh, comes out and plays and actually beats me. I thought I was the young kid coming in, and all of a sudden there's this kid two years younger than I coming on to the tour and you know competing at a high level right away. Our friendship started from the very first day. Uh, you know, the, his attitude and, and the way he went about things and, and the way I went about things kind of, you know, meshed. Vetus arrived at the upper echelon of the game just as the financial floodgates opened. With world team tennis, the best players in the world were raising the profile and the stakes of their sport. Vetus would take his blue-collar work ethic to the Pittsburgh Triangles. Vetus had turned Pittsburgh into a tennis town. He was just about to turn 21, and after a, a Pittsburgh Triangles World Team Tennis match, he announced to the, the people there, you know, there were a couple thousand people there, he said, hey, you know, I turned 21, it's my birthday, there's going to be a big party at the such and such hotel, and it's going to be a pajama party, so come. And there were hundreds of people at one or two in the morning, hundreds and hundreds of people walking into the Sheraton. No one had alerted the hotel manager to the fact that this was happening. <laughs> it was a pretty funny scene and, and an unbelievable party that I'm sure they talked about in Pittsburgh for many years. When it came to the slams, Vetus proved he could rise to the challenge here as well. In 1977, he played what many have called one of the best matches in Wimbledon history when he squared off against future friend and practice partner, Bjorn Borg. It's probably one of the better matches uh, I played, or I think maybe Vita's played too. <laughs> <laughs> Always a play, boy. That match really had almost a tone of an exhibition. These guys were hitting spectacular shots. McEnroe and I were playing the mixed doubles quarterfinal. John had just lost to Jimmy in the semis, the first semifinal of the day. So I wasn't actually able to watch to the extent I would have liked to because uh, our match took a long time. We went deep into a third set and I sort of watched the scoreboard and heard a lot of noise and knew it was a great match. Two different players, two different styles, bringing out the best from each other and that's what everybody likes to see. We did not only for one or two, three sets, we did that for five sets. The big moment was a 3-2 in the fifth set. Vetus was up a break in the fifth. Three more holds and he's in the finals of Wimbledon and he got a game point. He hesitated and he failed to come in behind a second serve, which was very unlike Vetus Gariolitis. Borg won that point, came back and broke and eventually beat Vitas 8-6 in the fifth. And Vitas had chances, a lot of chances, so I was really lucky to win that particular match. After that match, uh, that's when our friendship really started. The next day, I was practicing, and right before we went on to the practice courts, one guy is coming down to, to the club, and I was thinking, I mean, it looks like Vitas. And I said, it cannot be Vitas. But when he came closer, it was Vitas coming down to this uh, club in Hampstead. And, uh, and I said, what are you doing here? We started to talk about the match a little bit. Then he said to me, uh, any time you want to practice, uh, I'm willing to, to do it. That's when everything happened with the relationship and friendship with me and Vitas. For Vitas to, or, or, or any guy in any sport to come down the next day, surprised everybody. I mean, Vitas was not only a great tennis player, but he was a great person too. Long live the Pittsburgh Triangles. Uh, Jimmy, I'll start with you here. You heard that story from Borg. Loses an epic five-setter in the semifinals of Wimbledon, then says, I'll practice with you whenever you want. In the 79 U.S. Open final, loses to McEnroe. After that match, they go out clubbing together. He's toasting Johnny Mack. I mean, I've never heard of that. Oh, what does that say about Vitas? Well, I think 
what it says to me is that he's a bit of old school from the early days. The Australians used to compete hard. They'd play the match to their fullest fighting. And then after the match, they would all go out, drink, and have a great time together. And I think Vetus was a little bit that way. He competed very hard, but he didn't take the competition personally. And that's one of the things that was interesting to me when I was listening to Jimmy, because Jimmy was a guy that did sort of take winning and losing a little bit personally. And the first time they played, Vetus beat him. And yet, Vetus still had the type of personality that was able to overcome that from Jimmy, because Jimmy, a lot of times, if you beat him, it took him a couple of days before he became your buddy. Yeah, it really showed that Vetus had this tremendous perspective because to lose that match against Bjorn, 8-6 in the fifth, after he was up a break, it must have been just crushing to Vetus. But then to go find Bjorn and offer to practice in the future, I think that was the smartest move that Vetus could do at that time because they became such friends. They were practice partners. And to be able to practice with Borg, who was basically like a wall for the next, uh, you know, major part of your career, I think it really helped to improve Vetus's game. Um, he just had this ability to disconnect from what happened on the court and enjoy life. And that's basically why we're talking about him still today, because he had a fantastic career that one major you know, missed winning at the 79 U.S. Open. That's the one that got away. That he, it was Actually, John won pretty straightforward. That's the one that Vetus really wanted to win because he had grown up so close to Queens in Fleshy Meadow. But uh, it, this guy, he was had this ability to disconnect the two and, and put life into perspective, and so few athletes have that. That's a great point because he had the perspective to know that, you know, practicing with one of the legends of the game would actually – help my career. Uh, Jan, Mike, when we talk about Vitas Garolaitis, uh, what stands out more to you, his days on the court or his nights off the court? <laughs> I think a little bit of both. I, I, I'm super impressed with his, his ability to disconnect from, you know, from a match like that and, and then actually go out and, and, you know, befriend somebody or even be around somebody. I, I, I didn't have that ability myself. I needed to be away and and you know i tried to reset the next day that was kind of always the thing for me is okay I'm, the next day i'm gonna wake up and try to improve um that same day was not something and you don't want to be around me but um i i just am impressed that he kind of was able to hold it all together uh for so long and and i think that you know we're talking about how hard he worked and and he was he was willing to go and hit with borg anytime that's the thing he said i'll hit with you anytime that's uh and we're talking about a guy who was number three in the world <laughs> you know in the later on um, but a top 10 player already, and, and just uh, that's pretty amazing to be able to say that. And before beating John Lloyd in the Australian Open final, what does he do? He practices with him before that <laughs> match. I mean, unprecedented stuff. When we come back, much more on the great Vetus Garolitis, including that triumph in Australia in 1977. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 